Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Robinson, a business development manager with SM Magnetics. And today's video topic, we are going to discuss uh, parallel coding, uh, specifically on magnets. And today I have with me uh, Kevin Kurtz. He is the vice president uh, over at Quadrant. And uh, I'm going to just ask him a few questions and uh, we'll, we'll go from here. Kevin, thanks for, uh, thanks for stopping by for this. No problem at all, Andy. Anytime. All right. So yeah, first question is, are there different types of paralene? Uh, yeah, actually, there, there's many different types. Uh, primarily, we're going to focus on the three most used ones. Uh, of course, with any chemical process, you can, you can make a, uh, an abundance of different uh, variations. But some of them have better properties than, than others. So uh, we'll focus on N, C, and D. Uh, they're, they're not named terribly creatively. The paralene type N, it's really basic, and it has the highest dielectric strength but it may not be the best for environmental coding. So it can uh, uh, do quite a bit, but it's not used as often in some of the other fields as the C and D is, and we'll, we'll go through why that is. But uh, so this dielectric constant is really independent of the electrical frequency. So you can use it in high frequency applications. Typically that's a problem for anything that doesn't have a really good or a constant dielectric, con or dielectric constant. Uh, because of the eddy currents that we mentioned, you'll actually build up an electrical charge on those, those interfaces that can have negative effects. So we don't want that. We talked about that as the type N, it does all those things. Um, but it's not great at, at a couple of things. And one of them is going to be that uh, environmental. Uh, it's, it's got a, the ability to break down the perylene a little easier than the type C. So medical applications, specifically things in like caustic environments, are going to want the perylene type C. It only has a medium dielectric uh, strength, so it doesn't have quite the electrical resistance of the type N. But the environmental protection is going to be much better. There's you, you can't have the paralene breaking down in some of these applications. So uh, you'll see in medical in medical uh, customers most likely you would see this paralene type C, which is one we really focus on. We specialize in that, uh, but you'll see it in MEM system, microelectrical mechanical systems that have you know we're talking small actuators, things like that that need to be coded. Anything that's going in a strange environment might have that type C to it. And then there's type D, which we actually do as well if it's required. Uh, and it's going to be more for aerospace or other things that are uh, uh, don't require quite the protection of, let's say, in body of type C. It's not uh, type D is not biocompatible, so you're not going to be able to put it inside of a body. But it's commonly used uh, in electrical applications because it's still got that medium dielectric strength, and you can withstand uh, higher temperatures than the type C can, which makes it great for like an aerospace application that you need a dielectric insulator. Okay. So it sounds like they all three have their benefits and their, their pitfalls, if you will. Um, so can you explain how the perylene coating is done? Yeah, uh, perylene is actually a polymer film. I, I didn't really go into what it was, just what it does, but uh, it can be built up on itself uh, in, in several different ways. So you can kind of grow these from a single molecule to a, to a polymer. And you'll see that process happen. So uh, initially, we have, we have to prep the sample. Of course, we want to make sure that it doesn't have any rust or any sort of oxidation underneath the perylene coating. So it's got to be perfectly clean when we start. So we're going to do an inspection of it, make sure it's OK. We'll do like an ultrasonic cleaning and a, a really weak acid bath. This acid material is meant to cross-react with the iron oxide. It'll actually etch away any of the uh, rust or oxidation that we might have created just in the process from building the magnet to getting to the the plating machine or the coating machine, uh, you could have possible oxidation because we're in an oxygen rich environment. So we're going to have a, a weak acid etching that's going to clear off all of that. Then we're going to use a vacuum drying process. That way we don't have the oxygen, uh, the oxygen in the air when we're drying the magnet. So there's no way that we're going to get additional oxidation. We actually dry this in a vacuum to keep it react from reacting with anything else. And then we'll start the perylene coating process. So that's going to be done under vacuum as well, because we don't want any oxygen underneath of this uh, perylene material. It needs to go on. It can't be, it can't have any other contaminants underneath of it. It needs to go on as a thin film all by itself. So we don't want anything else in the environment. So we're not going to backfill with argon or anything else that you might see in a centering oven. Uh, we're going to keep this all under vacuum. The uh, perylene is going to come in as a powder. Uh, it's actually, it's a, it's a powdered dimer process and we're going to vaporize that. So it's going to be in the vacuum system and it's going to get heated to 
150C, something like that. It's actually going to start to turn into a gas. And we're going to keep heating that. We're going to get it up to about 700C. And it's going to become what we call a gaseous monomer. Uh, and it's actually going to flow through this vacuum chamber and coat everything inside. So we can actually like basically hang the magnets or put them on any any sort of material that that suspends them in such a way that the polymer can get all the way around them on all sides. And it's actually going to deposit itself in a really uh, relaxed way that has a uh, a high degree of uh, conformity between this. It's going to have a really high uh, thickness, you know, low tolerance on the, uh, or a high tolerance on the, the thickness. The thickness is going to be very uniform across the whole magnet, which can be really helpful for this. Uh, and that's because it deposits itself literally one molecule at a time and builds up a structure on its own. Uh, and the thickness is, is variable based on the time it's in there. So we're going to put a certain amount of perylene that's going to be melted down. It's going to sit in there a certain amount of time and basically flow around and build itself up on the outside. Uh, there's no liquid phase. It actually goes straight from the pelletized or the, the powderized process uh, and goes straight to a gas, which is good because we don't have any off-gassing. We have no catalyzing agent. Like I said, we don't want anything else underneath of this perylene. So we have to be really careful that it's the only object in this whole little universe besides the magnet. So that's going to be pushed in there at that high temperature. Uh, and then we'll let it cool and we'll let it deposit. And as it cools back down, it's going to turn back into that powder phase or into that uh, uh, more hardened state from a gas. And it's going to deposit itself because this is, is such a uniform gaseous environment. When it melts down, it's just basically going to be, you know, like a candle wax substance on everything in the area, which is just the magnet, luckily. Through this process, can you give us a quick summary really about the equipment that's used? and and is all the equipment the same or is there different machines you can use? Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Uh, the machines are gonna be pretty similar because the process is uh, such a well-known state. A vapor deposition is something we've done before, but it's gonna depend on the type of paralleling you're using, using and what you're trying to coat. Uh, what you're doing. So you can go to, there's, there's several manufacturers that build uh, paralleling coating equipment, but it really takes a, a specialist that knows what they're doing to get this heat cycle down. And they, this heat cycle and uh, cooling process are going to be different for every material you're coating. So uh, our specialization is usually coating magnetic materials. So we've got these programs that are really down for how to properly coat these magnet materials and get this uniform uh, non- uh, contaminated process for that. Uh, if you cool it too quickly, you may not have that uniform state. If you heat it up too fast, you could have other problems with basically burning off the material. Uh, it has to, it has to, I just generalize some of these temperatures, but it really has to go through this stepped function that you, uh, you set up a lot like a centering process. We've got a, a, a heating and cooling cycle program. So it does take really a specialized, uh, an experienced team to be able to do this properly. Even though the machines are widely available, you can find them you know, at, at, from several different manufacturers. Uh, that leads into the, the point that not all paralene coating equipment is obviously the same. So you've got these machines that we've programmed for a certain way. Even if you have two people running the same machine, they may do it differently. So make sure you find a uh, somebody who specializes in this and really knows what they're doing. Otherwise, you could have pinholes or other you know, problems in the uh, paralene coating process where they're not completely coated or uh, uniformly done. Earlier, you mentioned, you know, really perylene is great because the way it builds up one molecule at a time during the coating process, we get a really uniform uh, thickness all the way around a magnet. So how, how do you test the thickness? Uh, there's a couple different ways. So uh, the best way is going to be to uh, non-destructively, you can use an x-ray test to see how the coating, the coating is going to react differently to an x-ray than the density of the NDFEB material. So you can actually see the thickness based on a, a test that way. You could also cross-section it if you're really careful and take like a, a scanning electron mi microscope, an SEM material or an SEM uh, and look and see what layers are magnet, you know, make sure there's no contamination underneath and look for the coating thickness. But x-ray is going to be the most common in the field because it's a non-destructive test. You can throw a bunch of parts in there and, and test really quickly how thick the, uh, the coating was and make sure it was uniform across the whole uh, whatever's being coated. Oh, sure. So staying with this, and now we're going to talk about pinholes for just a minute. So now we know how to test for the thickness. 
So how do we test to make sure you have total coverage? That's probably the most important test. The thickness is not terribly important to most people as long as it's uniform and doesn't have any bumps or anything that's gonna mess up their uh, final tolerances on the magnet or whatever you're coding. So the thickness is kind of secondary as long as it's thick enough to protect from the environment. Uh, the pinhole is gonna be the way more important test. If this does not get uniformly placed, if there's little bridges and gaps between there, if you can get any sort of oxidation in, we're going to have that process we talked about with the, the magnets oxidizing and rusting, and they want to so badly. Every part of that magnet reacts with oxygen so very quickly. So this is a, it's a very important thing to test for, and, I, and one of the reasons you really want to use a, a good perylene coder that knows what they're doing, because otherwise you might just have a bunch of rusted magnets. And if you're particularly, we talked about medical application a lot, uh, we can't have any sort of oxidation inside the body. This has to be has to be thorough. So the pinhole test is probably the most important. And the best way to do that, we can actually visually look for them, but the best way to test them is to let uh, a lot of the magnets try to oxidize and see what happens. So we'll put them in an actual salt spray test environment. This is an increased corrosive environment. We'll put some additional heat on them. We'll create some uh, salt gas using a, a saline solution. We'll actually vaporize this gas and put it in a chamber and let it sit for like 25, you know, 24, 25 hours with uh, this salt spray actually misting onto the surface. So think of how quickly a boat or something rusts out in the ocean and how they have to protect those. Uh, salt's one of the most corrosive uh, materials that we can get without being harmful in, in such a way. You know, we're not throwing an acid or anything with this. Uh, so much so, well, hard acid, so much so than it, it salt's a, a normal acidic process. But uh, yeah, so a salt spray test is really going to be the best way. You can do that for about 24 hours and you'll really be, you'll visually see if there was a pinhole, if there was a way for that salt to get in, you will know it. Okay. All right. So we, so this has been great. We've, we've talked a lot about you know, the different types of perylene, the coding process, and, and testing methods. So I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit on you here. And we're going to talk about the perylene process in and of it. As you know, it's very proprietary and confidential. So why is that? And what is the alternative for customers who need to audit a, a facility that does perylene? Uh, good. Like I said, yeah, everybody has their own process. So that's kind of why it's proprietary. It's not a standardized section. Uh, everybody's found the best way to do it. So they get that uniform co coding. So while the machines are, are pretty typical and um, we, we know over, you know, generalize what this process does, that exact program that they're using that works best for whatever you're trying to coding is, is very proprietary and protected. So they're probably not going to tell you the exact time cycles or heats that they're using on this. Uh, it'll be documented in a general fashion. And uh, to make it repeatable, uh, that's what's going to be important. So if you're switching uh, perylene facilities, you're going to want to do a lot of testing on these afterwards to make sure you don't have those pinholes, that you have these, this uniformity. Uh, but if you do have, if you've done, let's say, testing with a specific uh, uh, small perylene coating facility that's got this down to the way you want it on samples, they can work with a larger manufacturer to try to, to share those programs. You know, we can sign NDAs and things and, and really make that work so you get that consistency because you're going to have to audit this process. Specifically, we've spoken so much in the medical field, but every field is going to have some sort of auditing body, uh, if not internal auditing, to make sure that your quality control standards are there. But things like the FDA are not going to let you just willy-nilly spray on a coating. Uh, they've got to be taken, taken care of properly. So the auditing process, usually a, a larger manufacturer won't mind you seeing the facility. You can go through. They may not give you all the details of their programming and specs, uh, but you do want to, to at least audit and make sure that the, the process is there. It's, you know, see where, if anything's being outsourced, where that's available. Uh, walk through as a visual audit is probably a, a good way to do this and just learn about the process as you go. The other option is going to be to, uh, um, again, testing afterwards to make sure everything is good and sharing from from your original sampled process with one of the larger manufacturers so that they can kind of share the process and make sure you get uh, what you saw before if you can't physically be there. So the auditing process can be to match your sample runs with the, the newer builds and do some test builds to make sure that everything is, is exactly the same way as your other facility was set up. Well, well, Kevin, I, that's all the questions I have today. Um, you know, thank you for, again, thank you for taking the time uh, to answer these questions. Uh, everyone, we will have some contact information. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.